I'm Alexander Hefner, your host on The Open Mind at home, and I'm thrilled to welcome to our broadcast today, Jack Jackson. He is the author of this really important book, Law Without Future, by the University of Pennsylvania Press. Uh, it's a terrific book. I urge our listeners and viewers to check it out. I hope you in the greater Northwest are staying safe and well at home. Trying to. Thank you, Alexander. Uh, Jack, the, the title of your book immediately got my attention. And, and of course, there are ample examples that you point to in the body of uh, violating constitutional norms that have uh, been ones we as a nation have adhered to. Uh, but 2020 does seem like a test as to whether or not we will have a future with law. Um, and so I wonder, now that this has been published and you had been on the road up until COVID talking about this book, what do you say about a future without law? Um, you know, the, or without the Constitution being respected? Well, I want to I pause a little bit on that because I, uh, part of what I'm trying to do in the book is to pull apart um, a commitment to uh, constitutional democracy and a commitment to uh, our current constitution. Uh, so um, I, I have some hesitation about uh, embracing the constitution or, or thinking uh, uh, the con US constitution is a safe harbor uh, for what we'll just broadly call political freedom and justice uh, in, in the present. Um, looking at 2020, uh, on the one hand, um, I'm not surprised uh, uh, too much by, by what's been going on. Um, you know, many people think that uh, what we're witnessing is somehow Trump specific uh, in 2020, or it's the current attorney general. Uh, and part of what I try to show in the book is that this has uh, actually been an, a, a long uh, ongoing process on the political right uh, of a certain kind of uh, deterioration of constitutional uh, practice or a deterioration of a commitment uh, to constitutional norms. Uh, you know, when I look at 2020 right now, I must confess, I, I feel more hopeful than I have in some time. Uh, let me just give you a, an example and a reason why I feel hopeful right now. Um, with the ongoing uprising of Black Lives Matter against police brutality and the prison industrial complex, uh, you have had two, two sort of, maybe th we'll say three responses. Uh, one is a sort of authoritarian uh, uh, unleashing of violence, which I think you see in the nation's capital with the president. There's a second response, and this one troubles me actually as much. And uh, you see this with Mayor Keisha Bottoms in Atlanta, uh, who's now being touted as a possible vice presidential candidate for Joe Biden. Uh, she came out, I believe this was the second day of the protest, and she told the, the protesters to go home. She said, go home and go vote. Uh, as, as a response to this. A third uh, response has been the protesters uh, booing her, telling her to go home. You see something similar happening in Minneapolis, uh, where there's a sort of refusal uh, to simply go home and go vote uh, and play by uh, established rules. And I think uh, there's something hopeful about that, hopeful about the future of both constitutionalism and some of our most important constitutional values. That is, I think the people in the streets right now uh, are our best bet uh, for realizing uh, doctrines or promises of, say, equal protection under law right now. So my when they, argument, I'm sorry, Alexander, go ahead. No, no, no worries. When they are specific in their demands, these citizen activists are their own best legislators when they can commit to not just espousing those principles in the streets, but actually legislating their goals tangibly. Well, yeah, let me say yes and no um, on that. And uh, I want to start with the no, the no, no part first. Um, and I'll just stick with uh, uh, Mayor Bottoms, because again, I think, and I don't want to pick on the mayor of Atlanta, but I think she's exemplary of, of a broader uh, thing here. Her message again was, uh, go home and, and go vote. Now, in the United States right now, um, as many of your viewers are probably well aware, um, we have in a variety of states in the union, uh, felon disenfranchisement law. That is, if you've been convicted of, of a felony, um, you can be stripped of your right to vote permanently for a long duration of time. Uh, this is particularly prominent, uh, but not exclusive to, but prominent in states of the um, Old South. And 
So you have situations where I think, um, I believe it was in 2017, now it's changed a little bit, but in 2017 in Florida, I believe it was something like uh, one in five uh, African-American adults were disenfranchised uh, due to felon disenfranchisement. Uh, and as authors such as uh, uh, Michelle Alexander and Angela Davis have pointed out, that radically racially disproportionate disenfranchisement is a result of the uh, unequal policing practices that you have a rebellion going on right now in the United States. So you have felon disenfranchisement, uh, you have uh, really radical forms of gerrymandering, which the Supreme Court uh, has signed off on, uh, and you have an electoral college, which allowed uh, uh, twice now in our, in our lifetime, a president to lose the vote, but nonetheless come into power. So there's something I think fundamentally amiss and problematic uh, for a mayor to come out and say, go home and go vote, if 20% of the population no longer has the vote, or as we saw in Georgia this week, uh, you, you don't have enough polling places and you, and you basically try to overthrow democracy with fatigue, as you have to stand online for three, three to four to five hours. So, um, you know, this, this is part of what my critique is, that liberals uh, have said, well, just follow the Constitution. But all of these forms of anti-democratic practice are, at least right now with current jurisprudence, perfectly consistent with the U.S. Constitution. So if you have this response to the authoritarianism of Trump, and you say, just go vote, just, we just have to get back to the Constitution, you're missing uh, 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 the kinds of radical disenfranchisement that are already constitutional. And I think you will miss the importance and vitality of the, of the revolt that we're seeing in the United States today. Citizen legislator, though, and citizen lobbyist uh, is different from citizen voter in the sense that you point out not only about felon disenfranchisement, but the fact that in Wisconsin and Georgia and elsewhere, there were nurses who were working 20 hour shifts who couldn't vote. And, and they couldn't vote because polling places were removed and there was a subjugation of democratic norms, decency and franchise in, in the, the, not just the inner limit, the, the inner communities of um, sort of urban life, but, but expansively into the suburbs of Atlanta. So uh, you're, you're absolutely right to point to the fact that, that voting can't necessarily uphold whatever constitutional values we find to be uh, absent under Trump uh, or aspire to better in a future administration. But I do wonder in the case of municipalities and states where immediate legislative goals can be achieved, if at least that civic activity on the ground legislating with some reforms can, can then galvanize the voting constituencies. It might be, the point is, it might be easier right now to affect legislative outcomes than voting outcomes. Uh, I, I, think, I think you're right. Um, but I think I just want to reemphasize again without uh, overly belaboring the point. Um, if protesters on day two in Atlanta or in other, other cities, Seattle, Minneapolis, if they had listened uh, to their, uh, and I just think this is important, their liberal democratic mayors and said, go home. Uh, again, that's not, that's not the message of Trump. Now the, the, the Trump authoritarianism is its own set of uh, problems. But part of what I'm arguing in the book is that that kind of authoritarian uh, erosion or assault on constitutional practice has actually been aided and abetted by a certain kind of liberal hostility uh, to civil unrest, but even more broadly, just a hostility to politics. Uh, this desire that if we can just depoliticize uh, public life in general and depoliticize the law more specifically, uh, that somehow we will have, again, I'll just stick with uh, political freedom and justice uh, broadly conceived. And so I think there's a certain kind of um, rather, you know, and it, we often think of this as resistance, that there's resistance to, to the Trump administration by the, uh, by, by the liberal mayors. But part of what I think you see is a certain kind of um, complementary vision uh, that's actually lurking behind the apparent antagonisms uh, that we often talk about when we talk about day-to-day -day politics on the, on the surface. I mean, your book points out the the day-to-day -day deviousness and, uh, of those who would violate democratic values, but it it also raises this point of the fact that there have been anti-constitutional um, 
politicians um, that have posed as the arbiters of, of constitutionality for some time. I mean, often the anti-constitutional politics are masked in fidelity to the constitution, right? So up the whole up is down, left is right of our politics today. Those who are advocating for the constitution are wanting to realize a constitution as it was practiced before Roe v. Wade, before Brown v. Board, um, or perhaps even before the 13th, 14th, and 15th. Before, before Plessy, before Marbury v. Madison, you know, but that's the point, which is that the deviousness was somewhat closeted. And now under Trump, it's become more explicit in its manifestations. For instance, the president of the United States saying he doesn't trust the veracity of a jury's decision in a trial involving a former aide who he will likely pardon, right? So there are things that we've seen that go to checks and balances that really haven't been adjudicated for some time. Uh, this question of how the Constitution is prepared to realize our pluralistic societal advancement, I'm just going to put that to the side for a second to talk about the basic fiber of the Constitution that's in jeopardy right now. Um, that that has more to do with checks and balances and rule of law in a in a, in a larger overview, uh, and I wanted you to expound on that. Um, I, I I have a I have a certain uh, resistance. You know, so much of resistance is resistance to Trump. Uh, my, my my resistance, uh, I think, intellectually and politically, is a certain kind of resistance to a Trump-centered analysis. Um, of, of what you're talking about or what we're, what we're witnessing here. So um, let me give you an example that I think speaks to what you're talking about, but doesn't involve Trump and in fact precedes Trump. Uh, and this was, uh, I discussed this in the book, uh, it was the uh, Republican-led uh, Senate uh, after Justice Scalia died. And um, your viewers will re recall this, uh, uh, President Obama nominated uh, Judge Merrick Garland uh, to fill Justice Scalia's seat. And the Republicans in the United States Senate uh, effectively uh, stripped the president of a basic constitutional power that the president has, the power to appoint right. justices. Now, the Senate does have advice and consent uh, power, uh, but they also actually negated that uh, because what they said is we are not going to advise and consent or our one moment of advice and consent is to blow that up and we're going to send this to the people. Uh, the people will decide in 2016 who gets to uh, have Justice Scalia's seat. And uh, what I argue in the book is that this is um, actually uh, incompatible uh, with constitutional practice. But, and this maybe gets to your point, it's fundamentally incompatible uh, with anyone who has a commitment to traditionalism and originalism. Uh, that is, the, the nomination process for Supreme Court justices explicitly excludes the House of Representatives, uh, those closest uh, to the people. So, you had at the same time uh, senator, Republican senators coming out and saying, we want to honor the legacy of Justice Scalia, who's an originalist, and then engage in a kind of um, uh, popular populist uh, anti-constitutional move uh, to, throw the, uh, to throw the nomination process uh, to, the, to the people. Now, I actually think that's a provocative idea that's worthy of discussion. Uh, perhaps the Senate shouldn't uh, be involved, but what made this gambit anti-constitutional is that when it looked like, you can go back, there were many interviews, when it looked like uh, Hillary Rodham Clinton would be president in those final weeks leading up to the election in 2016, uh, these same people, figures in think tanks, uh, Republicans in the United States Senate, these same people who had said the people should be deciding started to lay the groundwork that if, if, if Clinton becomes president, we are going to negate her capacity to fill this seat or, and this was the so-called moderate position, we're going to uh, confirm Judge Garland immediately before she has the chance to nominate someone, which is also a negation um, of the newfound principle that the people um, should decide. So that kind of um, checks and balances um, that you're talking about uh, was already set ablaze in the Senate uh, with the case of Judge Garland. And laying the groundwork for um, even negating that principle um, is in the terminology I'm using part of what makes it anti-constitutional and incom uh, incompatible uh, with constitutional government, and it preceded the election of Trump. I can't emphasize that enough. Yeah. 
I know, Jack, you are a symptom guy. Trump is a symptom. I, I am. I, I know you are firmly in that camp, and I'm, and I'm pushing you on this, even though I agree with your point, and that was one of the most astute comments in the book, which is to com comment on the abdication of um, normal constitutional order. Um, that is, Chuck Grassley uh, would not even convene a hearing um, or, or uh, consider the merit. Uh, and in doing so, it wasn't just a selective originalism. It was, it was a dereliction of duty uh, and a dereliction of the Constitution. Or I should, I should, I just want to pause for one second. I do think that one could come forward with a certain kind of constitutional principle and practice that might actually um, uh, have justification and applicability and in future instances. Right. So you could imagine a situation in which we develop a certain kind of constitutional practice and tradition in which uh, presidents don't get to appoint Supreme Court justices in the, in the final year of their term. But if that's a constitutional practice and principle, it surely wouldn't apply in the first year of Hillary Clinton's presidency. And it would apply during the last year of President Trump's presidency. Right. And, and, and I we'll see that, that quote, tested too. I it with Senator Lindsey Graham, but I, right. don't tell me that, who uh, came forward and said, well, of course we would not hold the same principle applied right. uh, to, to Judge Garland if a seat became available uh, during Trump's uh, not just final year, but perhaps um, final months. So it's not just that they broke with originalism. I'm not an originalist. That's fine. Uh, nor am I saying that uh, the constitutional practices disallow for innovation and new practices to emerge. Uh, what I'm arguing is that this invention of a constitutional principle that applies only on Tuesday to a particular candidate and not, and, and not beyond that, that's incompatible uh, right. with uh, constitutional practices and principles. Well, you, you say you're not an originalist, and you know that we've both spoken and written extensively about what could be described as a new originalism or a new constitutionalism. So, you know, the, that, I think one of the bright spots of the current moment is an acknowledgement of that selective constitutionalism or the hypocrisy in so many of the decisions. Um, and we may well see an opportunity for the Republicans to reveal themselves again with, with an opening on the court in the waning months of a Trump presidency uh, and a Republican controlled Senate that may or may not transpire. But how would you assess the effectiveness of the Democrats at this point or the Lincoln Project and, and the groups that have emerged to combat the unconstitutional or anti-constitutional rhetoric and, uh, print and principles or, or um, guidance in, uh, in, these, in these months of the campaign now um, we've, we've heard more explicit attacks on the unconstitutional, undemocratic governance of, of this administration. Um, I, I'm, it's difficult to speak of the Democrats collectively. There are real divisions in the party, and uh, there, there are members who I think um, have uh, been on this, uh, on this uh, addressing the, this issue uh, early. I still think they're very much a minority um, in, in the Democratic caucus. And uh, let me give you an example here. Um, one of the cases I discuss in the book was uh, President Trump's, uh, I believe it was his very first pardon. And this was the pardon of uh, uh, Sheriff Arpaio. And this actually, I think, relates to what we're seeing in the streets today. Um, for your viewers who don't remember, uh, Sheriff Joe Arpaio uh, was a, 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 a sheriff in Arizona, uh, had uh, for years um, abused uh, Latino citizens with racial profiling, abusive behavior, had been held in contempt of federal court uh, for violating the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. And before he could be sentenced uh, by the court, uh, Trump pardoned him. And I critically, uh, President Trump did not just pardon Joe Arpaio, but came out and explicitly celebrated uh, Arpaio's violation of the Equal Protection uh, rights of uh, disenfranchised uh, minorities and said, I am pardoning him precisely because he violated this fundamental constitutional principle. In my opinion, he should have been impeached the day after, or at least impeachment hearing should have been up and running. Uh, you don't get impeachment until very, very late. 
uh, and then it, and then it's tethered uh, to, to the to at least uh, apparently to the Biden campaign or, or what what is he doing to elite Democrats? So you have no impeachment when the president's uh, dismantling fundamental constitutional principles as it applies uh, to those who are disenfranchised and excluded. But when he engages in behavior that touches on elite Democrats, uh, suddenly it's it's time to, to seriously consider impeachment. And I think that's uh, I think that's revelatory, and I don't think it's lost on 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 protesters uh, in the streets. Uh, that I don't think they think uh, Democrats have their no, are Democrats not standing up, but are in many instances the authors of the kind of violence that the rebellion is against. Look, I mean, you can embody the politics of you know that that are that are treasonous in in your abuse of domestic as well as. Uh, foreign actors and yeah. the, your betrayal of, of e equal protection under the law, just as much as your betrayal of um, our sovereignty. So, I, so I to be clear, Ivan, I'm not saying that he that the impeachment. I, I signed on a, a letter. No, I, I know, I know. Supporting, I, supporting the, the impeachment uh, at, at that moment, and I don't disagree with the impeachment. What I'm noting is what triggers it and what does not. Oh, no, I think it's a, what are a the point Democrats well made. okay with and what are they not okay with? And that I think sure. is uh, uh, revelatory. Uh, right. And, and I do wonder, and I'd have to think about this more, if, if both aspects of that anti constitutionalism are, um, that are germane in the case of Trump, if they are both symptoms. Um, or if the, the foreign aspect of it is more specific to Trump to Russia, to his business enterprise, the whole Manchurian candidate president uh, piece of this puzzle. Um, but but I, I want to just close by giving you a chance to talk about um, the, the way in which Republicans still to this day will try to reinvent um, a constitutional standard that, um, that was, was either abolished or set back significantly by the Warren court. And they um, are, are disguising themselves in, a, in a, a constitutionalism, which you and I would say is anti-constitutional or unconstitutional, um, that betrays a lot of the, of the values of the pre-Rehnquist and Roberts court. And so wh where does that leave us with my first question? A future without constitution, with future without the, the, the dictates of the Warren Court, the jurisprudence of the Warren Court that has been so decisive in preserving or at least attempting to achieve civil society in this country. Um, I, 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 maybe I'll try and distinguish, make a, a distinction here. I think there are constitutional doctrines which the court may adopt uh, in, the, in, the, in the months and years ahead which I fundamentally disagree with. So let me just give you an example. If there are now five votes on the Supreme Court to overturn Roe v. Wade, or maybe more precisely, um, Casey versus Planned Parenthood, and so there's no longer a constitutional right um, uh, to abortion, and they adopt a very, um, a very narrow reading of due process liberty. Uh, and so there are some members of the court which say there's just no such thing as due process liberty. Now, I would be opposed to that, but I would still at least recognize it as a constitutional doctrine. Now, it's a constitutional doctrine uh, which would impoverish uh, our, our sense of liberty and uh, more importantly, I think, contribute to a, 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 a radical subordination of women's equality in the society. But I still think it would be a constitutional doctrine. So this is, again, another reason why it's simply because something is constitutional. Understood. That yeah. doesn't answer it for me. So, so that is one thing I think that we have to keep an eye on. There's also something different uh, so the case, I, we'll go back to Arpaio, uh, where the president is using a, a constitutional power, the power to pardon, to fundamentally sort of disorganize and dissolve uh, basic uh, constitutional practices. It's the latter that I'm calling anti-constitutional. So, uh, uh, right, or, or the defiance, the, we're running out of time, Jack, if you can believe it, but the defiance of subpoenas, yeah. again, go, going back to the rule of law, it, it pardons that on their face should not have merit in that they violate the core tenets that you describe. But, but in, the, in the seconds we have left, you do seem more hopeful today that it will not be Donald Trump and Roy Moore, and uh, we should include Mitch McConnell, of course, who, who define what, what American constitutionalism will mean in the future. Um, you, you do seem 
more hopeful than not at this juncture that that may be the case. Um, I have to say the ongoing protest in the United States uh, leaves me uh, more hopeful than I have been in a very, very long time. Uh, and I think that the, the, the young people on the streets are, are really compelling us to reconceptualize uh, basic constitutional principles uh, and are demanding uh, really a new constitutional vision. And, and for that, I'm quite hopeful and also very thankful. A new constitutional vision. Um, we appreciate your insight. Uh, encourage all of our listeners to think about both dimensions of the Constitution and to pick up your book. Jack Jackson, thank you so much for your time today. Alexander, it's been a real pleasure, and I, I hope to uh, we get to, to, to meet in person. Yes, me too. Okay, take good care. Thanks. Please visit the Open Mind website at 13.org slash Open Mind to view this program online or to access over 1,500 other interviews. And do check us out on Twitter and Facebook at Open Mind TV for updates on future programming. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Anne Olnick, Joan Gans Cooney, Lawrence B. Benenson, the Engelson Family Foundation, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America.